<laughs> a passionate educator and advocate, Juliana Ertube is the 2020-2021 Nevada State Teacher of the Year. She is the first Latinx Nevada State Teacher of the Year since at least 1992. Ms. Ertube holds a Bachelor of Arts in Bilingual Elementary Education and a Master's Degree in Special Bilingual Education from the University of Arizona. Ms. Ertube is a National Board Certified Teacher, Exceptional Needs Specialist, Early Childhood, and Young Adults. Currently, she is a hybrid educator at Booker Elementary School in Las Vegas, Nevada, where she serves as a co-teacher in pre-kindergarten through fifth grade special education settings and as an instructional strategist developing school-wide multi-tiered systems of supports for academic, social, emotional, and behavioral intervention. Previously, she taught special education in the resource setting at Crosswood Elementary School. She is warmly known as Ms. Earth for her work in unifying the school and advocating for and unifying the school community with gardens and murals. Ms. Ertu Bay is a National Board for Professional Teaching Standards Teacher Fellow, a Nevada Teach Plus Senior Policy Fellow, an Understood Teacher Fellow and Mentor, a Nevada Department of Education Superintendent Teacher Advisory Cabinet Member, a National Board Network of Accomplished Minoritized Educators Founding Board Member, and a learning facilitator with the Nevada National Board Professional Learning Institute. She is a recipient of the 2019 Chicanas por la Causa Esperanza Latina Teaching Award, a recipient of the 2019 Hispanic Education Association of Nevada Teacher of the Year, and a 2018 Rogers Foundation Heart of Education for America. Let's give her a round of applause. And applause. Good morning. Good morning. I can faintly see you all, but I'm so excited to be there. If you can hear me well, can I get a couple of hand waves from the back? Okay, wonderful. Don't be shy. If for whatever reason you can't hear or see me, please let me know. My kindergarten students always let me know, and it was the funniest thing. There's no panic, like the panic of knowing that your five-year-olds watching you teach can no longer hear or see you. Um, but good morning, everybody. It is my honor to be here with you all. Um, I am so excited uh, to join future and current teachers. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yes, my name is Julia Nortube, and I am a proud National Board Certified Teacher in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm a special education teacher, and I am bursting with pride months later after my announcement to be the 2021 National Teacher of the Year. It's a great honor. Um, and I'm honored to be here today to uh, talk about my work, but most importantly, to shine brilliance and light onto my school community. After all, my students and community are my best teachers, and they remind me every single day to lean forward with a soft heart and a fierce vision for a better tomorrow. Today, I'm going to be talking to you all about my method for teaching and designing educational spaces. It's what I like to call a joyous and just education. Before I get started, I do want to send a huge thank you to the Indiana University Southeast staff for seeking out teachers to talk to you all um, about your vision, your philosophy of education. I think that the most important thing, the thing that carries teachers throughout their career during the difficult times and the challenging times, as well as the great times, is our why. Um, really having a strong philosophy of why we educate, why it is our calling and our profession is so important. Um, I'd like to thank the Campus Life Office, the Campus Activities Board, the Equity and Diversity Board, and really shout out both your College of Education and your new Neighbors Center. Um, both of those things fit and align quite well with my philosophy of education. All right, so to get started, if everyone could get out their phone and scan this QR code, um, we're gonna do a little activity. If you happen not to have a phone that can capture the QR code, that's okay. Go ahead and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and then you can type in that code. And that code is going to take you to a question. 
And that question is, what is your why? What is your why for wanting to become a teacher, an educator? What if you're currently in the classroom, what is your why for staying in the classroom? What was your why this morning when you got up to join your colleagues, your peers, and me from across the country? Okay, so what we're going to do is you can type in a couple words into this and I have it active on another screen. Okay, and what we're gonna do is I want you to think about for a couple of seconds, what is your why? And then I'm gonna count back. Oh, good job. Okay, perfect. Go ahead and start pointing them in. Connections, students, light bulb moments, to make a difference, to give, to learn. Oh, look at what's coming up in the center is students making a difference, ins inspire, being positive forces in students' lives, progression, wonderful. Oh, yep. Yeah. To represent underrepresented and marginalized communities. Thank you, that is so important. Great. Now, uh, thank you for all these great answers. I'm gonna make sure I give everybody a chance to participate. Okay, and now I want you to think about what is the origin of your why? Where did that why come from? What is the origin of your why? Where did that why come from? Past teachers, your family, your grandmother, seeing your mom as a teacher and the difference she was able to make in people's lives. Your second grade teacher. True story, last night on Twitter, my second grade teacher found me <laughs> and she reached out and I swear to you, uh, my eyes just welled up full of tears. It got, I got transported back to being a second grader. So our past teachers make a huge influence and huge impact on us. Your dad, yourself, your experiences, your drive. Beautiful. Endless love that you receive from your teachers. Oh, that's so beautiful. I was watching um, a segment with Oprah that she was hosting and she shared the story of her teacher and how her teacher saved her life because at the time as a young child, she didn't have a safe loving place. And she can say without a doubt that it was the teachers in her life that put her on a path um, that allowed her to be where she is, your grandmother. Beautiful. Thank you all so much for sharing that with me. Um, I, I do this because I think that is so important each and every day in the profession that we're in to ground ourselves with our why. There are days that your why is so evident in everything that you do. And then there are days that are more challenging that we need to ground ourselves in our why. And remember that our why is collective. If you noticed, a lot of the answers were really similar. And I hope that what else you'll see is that you are reflected in my presentation, in my why, in my origin of my why. And that um, together as teachers and educators, we form a collective why. And this is all because of our ability to help other people shine. Nobody loses when we empower others when we create the space so that others can truly be empowered. Um, it's just a matter of making space, making sure we have equal access and equitable access to resources. Grounding your students and your classroom community, and if you're able to, your school community, in this idea of collectivism is really powerful because it means that we move forward with absolutely everybody together because it means that nobody's getting left behind and it ultimately means that we are more powerful together. This concept of not being a star, but making a constellation is so beautiful because it reminds me as a teacher, I have a lot of power and I have to be really careful about that power to make sure that that power is setting my students up for not just success academically, but so that they can thrive socially and emotionally so that they can feel connected to the others. So my role isn't to shine bright, 
my role is to constantly be making a constellation with as many people as possible. And that means my students, their families, their communities, my colleagues, and all of the staff at the school that I work at. So I'm going to share with you my story so that you can understand and see the origins of a joyous and just education framework. It's such an integral part of who I am as an educator. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, um, and like so many of my students, my family had to make the really difficult decision to leave Colombia. Um, it was during the height of our civil war, and in order to give my sisters and I a safer upbringing, my parents made the decision to migrate to the United States. When it was time for my parents to send us to school, I remember the sense of worry that my mother felt when she realized the school that I was going to go to along with, with my sisters felt unwelcoming. It felt gray and perhaps unsafe. And I think about um, my mother's journey at that moment. Think about how even though my parents were in a new country with a language that my mother didn't know just yet, um, I think that my immigration experience is very different than many first generation and Latinx folks and families. And it's different within the narrative because my family had access to dual citizenship. And because of that, my family was able to safely migrate with documentation. And we know that so many migrants, so many of my students don't have that privilege. Nonetheless, I can put myself in my mother's footsteps and what she must have felt feeling that lack of welcome despite her incredible journey and sacrifice. But I think about how that propelled her forward. My parents were able to make um, the decision to fight for my sisters and I to be at a school where our identities would be nurtured, where we would not only be connected to a love for learning because the school had a philosophy that students were an integral part of learning. It was project learning before project learning was cool. Um, and my parents were able to find a bilingual magnet program that was going to nurture not only our languages, but our identities and our connection to family. Given that my mom was a, a human rights lawyer in Colombia and my father a musician, the school agreed to enroll my sisters and I for offering Spanish classes and music classes in return. As a child, I was so lucky because I got to see my parents celebrated as a part of my education. Nonetheless, um, while I am so incredibly grateful to my parents for advocating, for putting themselves out there, um, for leveraging their skills and being proud of their skills, um, I know that an equitable education is something all students should have access to. It's not something families should have to fight for. It's something that should be in every neighborhood across our country. But this concept that has driven me to become an educator, an educator who sees the brilliance and the beauty in all families, who sees their strength, and um, who sees the value of building bridges between teachers who can acknowledge and create space for those bridges or for those strengths, I'm sorry. It's also so important to me to make sure that students have access to love their learning, particularly at Title I schools, schools where the majority of students receive free and reduced lunch are typically the schools where our students get the least amount of autonomy and love for learning. And so it's those concepts that really propelled me forward in creating what I call today a joyous and just education. But before I give you the definition, explain to you the pillars of a joyous and just education, I'd like to share a metaphor with you. In the beginning of the school year, um, I do this science activity with all of my students. I give them a bunch of different seeds and I ask them one simple essential question. What is inside that seed? And so we spend weeks looking at the scientific method, using discourse and conversation, using hypothesis and using our school garden that we co-created to decide what's inside of a, of a seed. After a couple of weeks, my students realize that inside of a seed is absolutely everything the seed needs to sprout. Um, in fact, my students discover that seeds have a sense of gravity, which is quite incredible. Be because of the sense of gravity, 
they know where to send their roots and where to send their shoots. Um, and this becomes a year long metaphor for what it means to be a person within a community. Because after all, just like the seeds, my students have everything they need inside to be able to thrive. We realize that it's all about the ecosystem that determines to what degree we're going to thrive. It's about the soil quality, the water quantity, the sunshine, and the caretakers of the land to determine how that seed's going to thrive. And ultimately, if that seed's going to be able to fulfill its role within our garden. Similarly, my students understand that they each have a vital role in um, our classroom ecosystem. And so this metaphor that we all have, what we need within ourselves, and it's our environment, is really a great uh, metaphor for all people. I want you to remember that, yes, every day we show up for our students' success, but your well being, your connectedness to your colleagues and to the staffs on the school campus is just as important as your students' learning and thriving. So let me break down the joyous and just education. Joy really is quite different than happiness. Happiness can be fleeting. Joy comes from a deep sense of belonging. Joy comes because you know your role, you know your value, your worth, and you know that in an interconnected community, you are one of many, but one that is valued, just like everybody else. Um, a joyous education really centers students' identities and their possibilities. It allows them to show up exactly who they are, without having to dim down any parts of them. And that's their language, their cultures, their identities, um, their ethnicities, their journeys and their story. Um, and centering who they are always includes their families and their communities. But in order to be able to do that, we have to create spaces at schools where families feel welcomed, where communities feel acknowledged and uplifted. And that's where the just of the joyous and just comes in. The just education acknowledges that we have a lot of work to do in terms of making sure our schools are equitable for all, our places where all thrive and all leave after being successful, being their full complete selves. To give you a short, a quick example, um, just the other day I was part of a panel celebrating the Crown Act. The Crown Act is a legislative piece that's been moving throughout the country, outlawing any kind of discrimination based on students' gear. It ensures that all students, particularly Black and African American students, can come to school with their hair in an Afro, twists, locks, however they most feel themselves. You would be surprised the amount of students who feel not only that their hair is unwelcomed in their schools, but literally excluded within dress code policies. And this bill not only did that for schools, but did it for employees all across. So that means that our students and our teachers who want to wear their hair in natural and textured ways get to do so. On this panel, one student um, shared how she had gotten a dress code violation and it paralyzed her eighth grade year because she felt that that was gonna go on her record and that she was gonna be looked at as somebody who was not compliant to the rules. And as I listened to her tell her story, my heart broke a little bit. The last thing I want my students is to be compliant to rules that don't nurture who they are. I wanna create a space where my students have voice in telling me, hey, Ms. Bird, this rule's not fair. It makes me feel this way. And for us to have community conversation about ensuring that our school policies, routines, practices mirror our students' brilliance. And so a just education acknowledges and commits to this process of ensuring that everybody has access, that we acknowledge both visible and invisible barriers to access for a better tomorrow. And that we're building based on collaboration not compliance. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more, but I wanted to plant that seed that our students get to be themselves more often when we nurture compliance or when we nurture collaboration and we're really careful about compliance measures. 
So therefore, the most important thing about a joyous and just education is that it's intentional and it's a holistic approach to designing our students' learning based on their identities and ensuring that each student has a key a role and voice in the educational ecosystem that we design with them. I'm gonna share with you four pillars, four takeaways about how after 10 years of working um, in building a joyous and just education, the four things that I learned that were really elemental and um, could be applied to anywhere. I'll share with you in just a little bit about the garden that we co-constructed, um, but the garden really serves as a metaphor. Not everybody wants or needs a garden at their school. Sometimes schools need different types of organizations or activities that really bring in community and really help foster the sense of togetherness and collectiveness. For me at my school at Crestwood Elementary, that for us was a garden. So a garden is a metaphor in this, in this scenario. But I'm gonna share four pillars that were really important and continue to be very important to me. And this transcends into any teaching space, even university. The first pillar um, is that inclusion is a key and intentional element of design. In our society, there are people who have been both excluded and purposefully marginalized from educational spaces from education being a thing that can transform their lives and doing so in a way that breaks free from only productivity and success measures, but really encapsulates what it means to be a part of a community. And so if we take the people who are most marginalized, most excluded from spaces, and we design the spaces for them, then that space is gonna fit absolutely everybody, and we're gonna be able to move on as a special education teacher, this is incredibly important for me that our educational spaces meet sensory, physical, and learning accommodations that kids with learning and thinking differences, people with disabilities might need. This also applies for folks who speak the language that is least common or perhaps least valued in the community, making sure that they, we have um, all the languages represented. This might look like something I did frequently, which was making sure we had an American Sign Language interpreter available at all of our garden clubs, all of our garden build days to ensure that all of our students could truly access. The next pillar is intergenerational learning. This is the heart of a joyous and just education. And it's so important to make sure that we have space for intergenerational learning. That means our students, siblings and cousins, their aunts and uncles, their grandparents, their parents. Um, for children, it's so validating and healing for them to see their families sincerely valued in this school. I know it was really healing for me as a child. Our school history, our public school history in this country has a lot of work to do in terms of healing uh, wounds of public education. If we look at the history of the American Indian boarding schools and how families were separated, if we look at segregation, English only laws, the list continues. Often I have parents who come up to me and share with me their own traumas, their own reservations about participating in a public education. And I listen with empathy because I understand how those things could have happened. And I tell them that I'm ready to work as hard as possible to build the healthy relationships with their ch children and with them so that they feel safe, welcome, and at peace when they're participating in our school. Next is an asset mindset. You might have word, heard this word quite a bit in education. It's one of those new bu buzzwords. I think it's so important to ground our asset mindset in social justice. We have to know the history of so many communities that haven't found success or haven't found a welcoming a smile at schools and really understand where is that coming from? And once we're able to ground our asset mindset in social justice and this idea of collectivism, then we understand diversity in thought, culture, language, traits are all positive attributes and that every single person in our community has something beautiful, wonderful, and helpful to share. And so students and families and teachers and staff, all of us, are seen for what we bring forward rather than what we're lacking. It is so elemental that every single educator and school staff member is ready, prepared, supported, and just as importantly, expected to meet families with an asset mindset, 
always. It makes a big difference. People know if you have an asset mindset about them or people know if you have reservations about them. So as teachers, we have the role as professionals to acknowledge our personal journey in terms of acknowledging others with assets. So I'm gonna tell you the story of how we co-constructed a garden at Crestwood Elementary. When I started at that school in 2013, I looked around and I saw a school that felt unwelcoming and felt unknown and perhaps slightly unsafe to others. To me, it looked like the neighborhood I grew up in. In fact, I ended up loving the community and buying a house down the street, buying my first house down the street and I still teach um, in the district, but I still live down the street from the school. Nonetheless, when I got to the school, I wondered how we could fuse and glue the school community together. I saw an opportunity to use a school as a space that would grow the community together. How could we make the space inviting and welcoming for all? How could we make it fun and make the space come to life? I used the garden in my classroom and I encouraged all the teachers in my school to also use the garden as part of their classroom. The garden ended up helping us recognize this need for holistically addressing mutual cultural and linguistic gaps between our teachers and our family. The garden, after all, was a place for all. It was a place to empower ourselves as educators. It was a place for our students to empower themselves with genuine holistic learning and a place for family members to feel at home. So in order to create this holistic environment, we had to center our students' academic and social and emotional needs in order to be able to center what was collectively our goal, making sure each one of our students thrived. So how did it begin? Well, it began because we um, wanted to create this space. It was that simple. And so in 2014, um, we had the opportunity with a small garden grant build five garden beds. Um, and if you fast forward six years later, we built four outdoor garden classrooms, each equipped with a whiteboard, seating area, um, in a garden of itself, over 15 beautiful inviting murals that were culturally affirming. And we transformed 15,000 square feet of our school. We started the garden along the street where our students walk to and from with their family. Um, and this was done intentionally because what we wanted to do was we wanted to capture not just the best sunlight, but we wanted to capture the eyes of the families walking our students to school. We wanted to make sure that our school communicated to the families that we were worthy of their sacrifice, of their journey, of their resilience. We were worthy of their educating their children and that we saw the beauty and the potential in their students. Um, and between the colorful walls and the plants welcoming the families, our school now unequivocally communicated to the families, this is a school, this is your school, and we are just so happy that you're here with us. We not only painted murals close to the garden, but we started painting them all over the school because we wanted all of the students at any given moment to be able to look up at the walls and see themselves not only reflected, but deeply celebrated. How did we build the garden? Well, I'll tell you, it was a very slow process. It was a process that was done with community voice and input. Um, no decision was made alone. Every decision had multiple students, family members, community members giving their input. And that's ultimately how we designed a garden that really fit our needs. Um, because families had very dynamic needs, teachers had to be very dynamic and creative in ensuring that we got that voice. We were very communicative with the families. We understood their work schedules. We understood that Saturday mornings might not be the best time for everybody to come participate. So we did things different times after school. Sometimes we do things early after school. So some, we live in Las Vegas, so the work schedule is 24 hours a day. So we did some after school so that parents who were working the night owl, the night, uh, shift could come in and it was really low lifts. We would paint maybe signs and offer a meal so that the point was to share time with the family. For other families who maybe were working until the evening, we planted some evening read alouds, some evening music time. And again, the low lifts, because we understood families were tired after work. 
what we wanted to ensure that they knew was that they were welcomed and that this was their space. Most of the build days did happen on Saturday just because we had to orchestrate all sorts of machinery and deliveries and as many as 200 people would show up every Saturday to help us build our garden. Um, we were creative about how families could engage and celebrated all forms of engagement. No work was undervalued in building the garden. And you can see our students working super hard. Um, you know, we were really, really touched when families who couldn't physically be there would drop off a jar of lemonade or a bowl of cut fruit to share with the volunteers. This told us that we were on the path of truly unifying the community. Um, and over the course of six years, we were collectively able to raise over $80,000 to expand and build our garden and mural, pure, mural program. Each single penny went to ensuring that our students had a joyous and just education. Our garden ended up serving as a model for hundreds of other schools, not just in our district, but in our state. We started a garden club called the Nomies. Um, and you can see their pointy hats and my gnomes behind me. Um, Nomies is a word that we made up. We put together the word gnome, you know, the little uh, mythical creatures that take care of gardens. And homies, you all are probably a little too young, but back in the day, there used to be these little plastic figurines called homies, um, and you could collect them all. And so um, we would bring little trinkets to take care of the garden, like little dinosaur toys and little homies. And anyway, the name came about because we put the word gnome and homie together and you fuse it and you get the word gnomies. So our students were known as gnomies and it's a proud badge of honor that they wear well after the elementary school days. Um, but we started this garden club so that we could ensure that the garden was bountiful so that the garden was safe and ready for all the classes to come in during the week to learn the garden. Um, and just as importantly, to share the harvest with our community. Our students would get up quite early once a week to join the club. And often families would tell me, this was the only day during the week that it was not a struggle to get their child up and ready for school. In fact, the child was often rushing them to come to school because they were so excited to be part of a community and to help us with the garden. We also ran monthly farmer markets that offered fresh fruits and vegetables to the community. The students decided that it was important to them to not charge for the, var for the vegetables and fruit and instead do a sliding donation. They were so warm and kind to their community. If someone came by who didn't happen, happen to have any cash or their wallet, the nomies would tell them, don't worry, please take what you want. Let us know how you enjoy it and come by the garden one day to check us out. And that's how the garden grew was really because of this genuine care for others. The Nomi's intrinsically embodied what it meant to have community care. We were also able to organize summer garden camps. And for 99% of the students attending my school, this was their first, this was the first time that they had ever had access to summer programming. And so we made sure to fundraise so that cost was not a barrier to absolutely anybody. We gathered family members, the picture to the right, you'll see um, those are all my past students, all my past Nomis who are now siblings of Nomis who were in the garden summer camp who came back to volunteer their time. We gathered their aunts and uncles, their parents, their grandparents, community elders, scientists, local gardeners and chefs to come and be a part of our summer garden camp. The Nomis participated in community service learning projects that it offered ideas and suggestions and tangible solutions to improving our garden ecosystem. They also harvested from the garden just about every single day and prepared meals. Our students during the garden camp got to sit down for a one hour lunch every single day where they sat in tables that were round and they looked at each other and had conversation during their meal. For those of you who have been in elementary schools, you know what a huge deal this is. Typically students sit in rows facing, the full, facing forward and they have a very limited amount, 10, 20 minutes to eat their food. We wanted to ensure that we were modeling the values that we thought were important to children's development, which was this connection to each other, this enjoyment of healthy food, and this commitment to getting to know each other's stories through dialogue. In my classroom, the garden, as you can imagine, was a centerpiece 
when we weren't in the garden, I brought the garden into my classroom. We would often have um, something growing <laughs> in the school, in my classroom. We uh, harvested um, monarch eggs and captured each part of the process in the metamorphosis. We had worm composting where the students were in charge of using fractions to determine how much um, fruits and vegetable they were needed to give the worms, how much their output in compost was. We always had ceilings. Everything in my classroom was centered around growth mindset. We celebrated all types of growth because after all, my students with special education needs needed this physical and metaphysical um, metaphor that they too could grow and that it was through nurturing others and other beings that we could nurture ourselves. My students with learning and thinking differences loved learning collectively, and they loved learning with their hands in the garden. Our garden was in the classroom no matter what. Um, and so I do wanna let you know that I have consent for all the stories that I'm about to share. And I was really honored when I was speaking to the families about sharing their stories. They not only asked me to share their stories, but they asked me to share their real names because they are so proud of um, this journey that they had together. First story I wanna tell you is about Orlene. He's one of my students with learning and thinking differences, um, particularly in math. And he was having a hard time finding success with multiplication and traditional models. And so when we were in the garden, I sent my students off to find patterns. That's all I said. I said, go find as many patterns as you can and come share the patterns that speak to you the most. Well, Orlean determined that our strawberry bed had three leaves per plant. And that if he wanted to find out the total number of leaves, all he had to do was skip count or find the multiples of three. And at that moment, Orlean began to multiply. He found it much easier to multiply by looking at the amounts of strawberry leaves on the plant. And it was having this holistic educational design that allowed his intuition, his observation, his confidence to lead the way. It allowed him to be his truest self while he was learning um, and learn in the way that made the most sense to him. If he had to go to the garden to complete his math tasks, we would all encourage him to go. Next is my student, Nessa. Nessa, when I met her in third grade, she was shy and reluctant. And the school had labeled her as an emergent English language speaker. As she was shy, she didn't really prefer to speak very often. It took me a little bit of time to really get to know her. And as I built a healthy relationship with her and her family, Vanessa shared with me that not only did she speak two languages, which I knew of, which was American Sign Language, both of her parents are deaf in English, but also she spoke Tagalog with her grandmother and Spanish with her other grandmother, making her quadrilingual. She spoke four languages. Vanessa inspired me to find a word that captured her brilliance. I no longer call my students English language learners or multilingual. I call them linguistically gifted because after all, anybody who has another language, whether or not they have a good hold on English is linguistically gifted because they have something to offer our community. And so I made sure that I communicated that with Nessa. Nessa, Nessa ended up blooming um, and she loved her languages and she was proud of her languages. She began to engage in more eye contact and she was more willing to express herself verbally. She ended up becoming one of my student teachers and she would teach the young ones their letter names and sound using American Sign Language. And all of our students found a lot of success in their partnership with Vanessa. The point is that holistic learning spaces allow our students to see themselves. And it's this sense of safety and peacefulness that encourages them to connect with themselves so that they connect with others. Next is my student, Leela. Oh, my sweet dear Leela. When I first met her, Leela's bangs were down to here and she had a really hard time connecting socially as she is neurologically diverse. She has autism um, she, and she used to hide behind those long bangs and on all of her work, she would constantly draw emojis. I'm gonna tell you guys a secret. Sometimes she would draw the little poop emoji on her math. 
trying to communicate to me, no, thank you. This is not for me. Um, I know <laughs> I don't share that often, but I feel like you all would really appreciate that. Um, and once she started drawing anime on her work, I knew that we were making headway. Uh, so by collecting, by engaging in collective learning, meaning that Leela knew she had strengths to offer others, and she also had needs so she could receive other people's strengths and support. Um, that's the collective learning that happened in my classroom. Leela was able to courageously confront her math and her discourse anxiety. She harnessed her growth mindset, understanding that if she understood how her brain worked, that she could find her strengths and offer more to others. She ended up being a great mathematician over the course of the years. Um, and she ended up being able to communicate in complete sentences that improved her writing, but also that um, gave her a sense of autonomy. Um, the following year, I got probably one of my most treasured teacher mementos. Um, in a letter Lila's mom wrote to me, she said the year that Lila came to my class was the year that she got her daughter back. And I don't tell you that to gloat. I tell you that to tell you how important you are in ensuring that your students connect back to their family. The truth, and this is a hard truth, sometimes education separates us from our families. But education also has a power to connect us back to our family. Lila learned how to use words to communicate to others how she felt, what her needs were, and therefore we were able to meet her needs. The next student I'm going to share with you is Mr. Joseph, Mr. AKA Comic Squad. He insisted people called him Mr. Comic, Comic Squad and I abided. And so he had a really hard time with his emotional regulation and, and managing his behavior at school. This impeded him from having friends and from being able to participate in class without being frustrated, even though he's twice exceptional, meaning he's gifted intellectually, he's in the highest I believe 5% of his intellectual capacity, and he also has autism. So we figured out how to harness his strengths. Um, some came from his autism and some from his intellectual giftedness um, into comics. And we would uh, tackle his biggest needs by drawing. Um, over our three years together, we created hundreds, and I mean hundreds of comics that allowed him to role play, remember calm ways to solve problems, and in his last year with me, when he was ready to go to 100% inclusion, meaning he wasn't going to have to leave his peers for special education services. In fact, we were just going to consult with his teacher because he was ready due to his growth. He made me a book that captured our journey together. This is one of the pages. It says on the top, there's no denying that Mr. Artebe is the best teacher around. Again, I don't tell you this to tell you how great of a teacher I am. I am, but I am a teacher who is deeply in love with my students, deeply in love with their possibilities and their humanity. And so the top you can see is 2017 and 18. Look at how he draws himself. Look at the distance between him and, and myself. Over the course of three years, the middle is 2018, 19. Look at his expression in his face and his last year with me, 2019, 2020. He is a fully realized human with expression, clothes, hair, and look at his proximity to me. It is due to his healthy relationship with me, a healthy relationship that acknowledges his strengths, his culture, his identity, his language, his family, um, that allowed us to have this kind of learning and growth together. Um, gonna, is it okay if I just go over a couple minutes? I wanna share one more story. I'm so excited to talk to um, the students. So I, I, I am going to share this story and I promise to move quickly through the rest. Um, over the years, I realized how important the school was for welcoming students who were newly arrived. Although I'm a special education teacher, all of the students at the school were my students. The garden allowed me to do this. So um, I, I'll never forget the day that I met Haynes. You'll see him on the left hand side. He was shy, but so eager and so warm. We didn't speak the same language. He spoke Tagalog, I speak Spanish and English, but luckily there's some similarities between Tagalog and Spanish. 
Um, I knew that Haynes wanted to be part of our school. So I did my best to translate an upcoming Google or um, I'm sorry, translate an upcoming uh, flyer for our garden build day. I used Google Translate. I did my absolute best. It probably wasn't perfect, but I handed it to him and I pointed to the garden and I said, come. And that Saturday he showed up with his Lolo, his grandfather. They each had a shovel in hand and they offered a bag of okra seeds for our garden. Haynes helped us build our first layer of this adobe cob bench. It's just hay, dirt, and water, but you have to build it a um, handful at a time. And so they helped us build that. Um, since that day, Haynes was a proud garden gnome and he never missed a day. During our next build day, his sister Hannah had joined us from the Philippines. Before Hannah had even left the Philippines, Haynes had made sure to fill out all of her paperwork, her permission slip, so she could participate in the garden club. Before leaving the Philippines, Hannah knew that there was this space that was waiting for her with open arms. Hannah and her mom and dad and her grandparents were able to, to help us finish our adobe cob bench. Next school year, Hyra, their youngest sister, arrived from the Philippines. And naturally, she joined her family and her um, siblings in the garden club. To think that our school was a safe space, a welcoming bridge for these students and their family, still brings me such a deep sense of joy and justice because of the rooted elements of community. Hannah, Haynes, and Hyra not only learned English while they were in the garden, but they gained confidence, friends, connection, and most importantly, a warm welcome with a strong sense of belonging. I recently ran into the family at our neighborhood grocery store and later that day, Hannah sent me this message. Just in case you can't see it, I'll read it to you. Miss Earth, the reason we wanted to join the garden club was because of how being surrounded around plants made us feel at home. In the Philippines, we were surrounded by green mountains and farms everywhere. As we all grew up and went to middle school and high school, the garden club was still something that means a lot to us. It wasn't just a club, it was a family. And so I have to tell you that for me, um, the garden club was also just a family. It, it was also just more than a club, it was a family. Teachers also blossomed in the garden. I consider myself one of those teachers who was able to truly blossom in the garden. The garden was an equalizer. It didn't matter what language you spoke, how much formal education you have, what country you were born in. The garden was a space where all work that was of equal value, where each person mattered. Um, and for our students, seeing their family celebrated and validated, just like I had been in my um, experience, validated my students. Um, and it's through this line of work that I was given the name Miss Earth. Every time I seen her, she she always had a smile, and every and you know how like plants come out of the earth, and she she made the, the plants that we have in a garden come out of here. So they call her Miss Earth a bit because she she created the garden. The truth is, and the point is that when you truly love your community holistically, when you've looked at your own biases, when you've looked at society's biases, and you create another world in the school, this is what happens. It's this genuine family-like love um, built on healthy relationships with families. So I'm gonna share a call to action and I just want you to keep this in the back of your mind as you engage in schools. Um, these are a few things that I think that a lot of teachers already do. And I just wanna remind everybody of just how important they are. The first is a trabajar, get to work. The most important thing is to address and, ex and, ask and, and assess for barriers. What are the things that keep people away, both intentionally and unintentionally? Truth is, it doesn't matter. We have to find ways that we understand what keeps people away and design ways to keep, bring them in. Remember that our labor to each other matters, and it matters when we do it collectively. This is why bees are so important. You can see, be the best you can be and I have a bee over here. Bees are so important to me because after all, they labor for others. In part, I escuchar to listen. We have to learn to listen. Listening is a really hard skill. We have to, in order to truly listen to somebody, we have to understand where they're coming from, their stories, their histories, their, their needs. 
So we have to commit to learning to listen to student and family voice. After all, it's not just one person, but it's everybody in the community together that brings us forward. So we have to find ways to legitimize the knowledge of the families and communities that we teach. Collaborate, to collaborate. Nobody can do this work alone. This work is done through collaboration. And research shows that collective teacher advocacy is three times more powerful than the socioeconomic access or status of our students. It's greater likely to influence student achievement, motivation, concentration, persistent and engagement because we have collective goals and a deep sense of belonging. Next, I have got to advocate. As an early career teacher, this might not be just yet where you're at, but eventually this will be a role that you can fill. It's signing on to this new acuerdo, this compact between educators, administration, your district, your state, your government, your policymakers, to use your voice as an educator as an amplifier for your students. Remember, hold on to your courage along the way. It's hard. Doing this kind of work takes up a lot of community. And so remember to hold on to your courage because that's what we need to be able to address um, this vast and complicated system and systematic uh, ways that inequity show up. The most important is a celebrar, a disfrutar, to enjoy and celebrate the fruits of our labors. Enjoy every single step forward that your students take. And as I leave you um, and transition into our discussion questions, I want to welcome everybody to allow your stories to embody your present. In my case, my family's perseverance became a part of my educational philosophy. And it's this philosophy that's the foundation of my outlook as an educator. I channel my family's perseverance to my students. I seek to find family strengths as I know all families carry strengths the way my family does. So I'll leave you with this message from my mother. This was one of the highlights of my career was when I was able to invite my mother to the garden to come see what we had created. She looked around and she said, ¿Cómo si es posible cambiar? El mundo sí puede cambiar y todos podemos ayudar a cambiarlo. Look how it is possible to change. The world can change and we can help it change. Thank you all so very much for engaging and learning with me. Future teachers are, are everything. You are literally the future of this country. And I am so excited and so grateful that you have chosen the most wonderful profession, not without faults, but the most wonderful profession the world has to offer. If you're interested in staying in touch, that's my handle, but you can also use that QR code to be able to um, get all of my social medias and stay connected with me. Thank you all very, very much.